Welcome to the Metal Boys. Today on the show, Canadian guitar god, Jeff Waters, Annihilator. Jeff, what's happening, man? Well, not god, but uh, yeah, I'm one, I'm one of the many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just glad to be here, and for, for those that are, are listening to this, you missed the best part of the interview, which is like we forgot we were supposed to do an interview and we we're just talking about things casually. Now we have to put on our fake interviewer and, and rock star metal guy uh, right. conversation. So you guys all missed out on everything. <laughs> so here we go. Triple threat, uh, yeah. a Juno nomination, uh, Suicide Society, of course, it was released about a year and a half, two years ago. So many things going on, but the biggest thing that's going on is the Canadian tour why now for the fans well just in a, a very quick nutshell you know just to sum it all up super quick you know 15 studio records from 1989 was our first one till 93 we got to tour the states and canada bands like testament would bring us on tour we do our headline stuff and then the scene kind of pretty much tanked for most metal stuff around 1992 93 and i was lucky enough that that europe and japan and, and eventually south america just uh got really big for us and kept us going since then but it, it was just like when I tried to come back here when the scene looked like it was you know promoters and clubs were starting up again and metal was getting some publicity in the early 2000s and and great you know younger players like Alexi Leho and, and the Bolio and, and um, Hefe from Trivium and all these guys were going back and spending eight hours a day practicing guitar listening to the 80s and uh, you know the 70s 80s guitar guys and really learning their instruments and bringing their version of metal back a bit. Um, by the time I tried to get in with Annihilator back in, it was like, the answers were pretty clear. It was like, well, you guys were never really big here, and it's not like a big reunion, and you 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 won't let us screw you over with a terrible contract, so we kind of would rather put our money into some younger bands that have a maybe a, do, a new twist on things. So I was like, oh well, that sucks, and I uh, just stayed overseas and everywhere else and had a good time, and still have have you know things are going fantastic as always um i sound like trump yeah. um but uh basically it came to the point where screw it i don't need a tour agency or a record company or anybody here i can just call all the uh the club owners up and their in-house booking people and say you know who we are and uh, we'd like to come back and do a tour and i was pretty uh surprised at how easy that was bypassing the corporate and the the business side of it uh yeah not business side but bypassing the agencies and all the people you're supposed to need to do a tour and uh realized how easy that was for me uh, i guess people figured out well at least they're good for one good canadian tour because people haven't seen them for so long they want to go check it out the first time and so at least we'll have one good round here at a minimum yeah i mean just to name some dates i'll just name them quickly okay uh yeah. victoria When's the tour start? What's the first day of the tour? Yeah, it's Victoria. Actually, that's that's one of the last couple of dates. We still we've announced the date and the city, Victoria, but the actual venue is probably being announced on Monday. But it, it, um, it's June. Yeah, that's June. I think it starts June thirteenth, Victoria. There might be a fourteenth, Vancouver. There might be a fifteenth, Penticton or Kelowna, and everything else is a go after that. It's uh, you so know Cal the whole round: Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, um, Waterloo. Waterloo, yeah. Toronto, Ottawa, Quebec City, June 29th in Montreal and Cornwall. And you're saying there's even more dates that are going to be added to this tour, correct? Yeah, I think there's a couple more. But we just we, we were getting a lot of offers in and we realized that we kind of started it maybe a few weeks too late because uh, at the end of it, at the Cornwall couple of shows we're doing for a, basically a friend of ours was... Um, ACDC's uh, tech since 1990. Um, he lives in Cornwall and he started a company called Wizard Amplifiers back in the 80s um, that bands, you know, people like ACDC and uh, Jimmy Page and uh, you just go on ZZ Top, Billy Gibbons, myself, a lot of people use Wizard Amps um, and he's buddies with a, a, a Quebec uh, guy that owns a, a nightclub in, in Cornwall. So we, we decided we'd end the tour for two nights in Cornwall and then we go off to do the uh, do the summer festival run in Europe. So we really didn't have any time to add dates. We can't really back it up either. So uh, we're going to jam this one. You know, I'm very excited about this. Um, what about the Juno nomination? Let's throw that in there. So for everybody out there who does not understand what a Juno is, it's a Nobel Peace Prize in Canada. Okay. It's a Grammy. Okay, it's a Grammy. <laughs> it's a Grammy. It's a Grammy. It's a Grammy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, that was really cool to be nominated because uh, the industry itself, uh, 
for example, I went to the the nominate like when when you're nominated, you get to go to this fancy uh, industry only dinner where they actually give out most of the awards. And the following night is is uh, at an arena and it's the televised event. Um, I didn't go to that one, but uh, I went to the first one where it's just the bands and the you know the the industry people, and that's where they gave out most of the awards. And it, it was kind of like. Uh, I'll give you an example. Got people like Drake and uh, The Weeknd and all these huge, famous, multi-platinum stars in the States and everywhere else in the world um, were up for nominations for things. And, um, you know, in their own genre of music, representing big time by selling ridiculous amounts of albums and, and just doing well outside their own country. Um, and a lot of them weren't even recognized. Uh, younger or new bands that nobody or most people hadn't heard of would win the awards. So it was kind of obvious what that was about. It was seemed a little bit more of a corporate thing. But um, the main reason is I wanted to bring my uh, my gal and some friends there because it was kind of like a fancy dress up thing, and, and they'd never seen me dress up in in a jacket before. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I basically had one of the best steaks I'd ever had sitting there, and I got to see how the, the you know the televised part worked and uh, meet some people I knew. And Brian Adams I'd known for a long time. I, I used to know him out in Vancouver, uh, and there was a lot of other people out there that uh, I hadn't seen in a long time from when I lived in Vancouver. So there was lots of reasons to go there. Didn't think we would win because it sounded like it wasn't really based on necessarily, you know, skill. It would kind of win out of popularity or sales or whatever. It was more of um, who you're signed to and who your manager, your publicist, your label and all that is. But it was fun. Were you shocked that you were nominated? I mean, did it just catch yeah. you? Did you know that maybe this might happen or it just out of the blue? I didn't really think so. I mean, I mean I, I'm not trying to be a goof here, but we've sold, uh, let's just say, more than two or three million records. And I just figured, well, if we ever hit 10 million someday, which wouldn't happen, but if we did, maybe we'll get recognized by getting nominated. It was like a joke. Um, and then, um, you know, we were, uh, you know, it, it was just weird to be nominated because we're, we've never really been part of the industry here. Um, Canada has a weird way of um, not, generally not supporting artists that go outside of their own country to sign their deals with, with you know, again, managers, record deals, publishers, all that stuff. So when you go outside of your country like we did to sign in New York to uh, Roadrunner Records, um, it was kind of like, it's almost like a blacklisting in a sense. And the only way it works out for you in Canada would be if you get, become so big or you're so commercial or radio friendly everywhere else that they have to recognize you here. They have no choice. And in our case, we don't get played on the radio and it's not that kind of music. So it was easy to just leave us out of their history, you know? Yeah, you know one thing I admire about you, and I think all bands need to take note. Not only are you, uh, you know, your craft, your the music side of stuff, you excel at that, but you understand the business, and I think that's where bands fail, right? Especially today, if you're not understanding the business and how to sell yourself or sell your music, you're not putting sticking your hands in there and getting them dirty, and really truly understand how to sell yourself. You just won't be able to make a living out of this. Do yeah. you agree? Disagree? Well, I think if you if you put aside the fact that bands that have usually older bands or bands that have been around like our band, if you've sold records consistently and you haven't like you know put two good albums out and then you you split up for twenty years and you do a reunion, if you're out there all the time uh, and have a catalog and you keep going and you keep getting on the tours and the big festivals and that then you're worth something to someone in the business. Uh, so if you take away the fact that we, we have a catalog and that we're, we have a track record of like, okay, these guys are likely going to sell and they, they, they get the calculator out and they take a guess what we're going to sell in Europe and in Japan and all that. Um, if you took that aside and we weren't uh, a band that has a track record or sale, previous sales, it's a really tough, tough business to be in. Uh, these days compared to the earlier days. I'm lucky because I got the catalog, but if you take that away um, and I was starting out and I was younger, um, that would be one heck of a tough job. So now you can still make a career out of it, but um, you really have to learn, learn, learn and keep your brain and body clear. You know what I mean? You don't have time to go out and there's just so many jobs you need to take care of now not just play guitar and write some riffs and let the singer write the lyrics and the bass player do his stuff and the drummer. It, it 
in a perfect band, perfect world, yes. But if you want to really do this for career, you got to you got to take on different hats, different roles, and learn to sort of say, well, I'm good at this. I can learn this. I can learn that. Good enough. But this one, I need to delegate and get get somebody else to do this. And you really have to really be careful because the budgets are, you know, you take off more than a zero off what the advances to do a record would be back in, in the late 80s. It's like if you're, like, it, give you a dumb example, but it's a, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Annihilator was an unknown band. We had a demo or two out in the 80s, in the mid 80s. They were very successful because demos and tape cassette trading was a huge thing, not for business, but for promotion and for fans. Um, and young bands needed demos uh, to, to just sort, sort of like record companies today say, okay, new band, how many Facebook likes do you have? How many hits on YouTube do you have? You know, yeah. um, it's similar to your cassette demos back then. Um, you just have to learn everything you can about how to do things. Uh, Alice and Heller first album, we were unknown and we got a huge amount of money um, to do that record from a smaller label called Roadrunner. And that's an independent metal label at the time. And if we, if bands had that kind of money today that I got on the Alice in Hell record for being an unknown band, I mean, bands would be, you know, <laughs> doing really well. That kind of money isn't out there anymore. So you got to learn how to do everything yourself. In the early days, you would hire a producer, then you'd hire an engineer, then you'd hire a mix engineer, then a mastering engineer. You'd pay four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars U.S. For a photographer to do the promo shoots, uh, you, you, the list would go on. And nowadays, it's more like, okay, you got to hope you have a friend that is the best photographer friend you have. Cut him a deal, buy him dinner, lend him your car for a few weeks, do do whatever you have to. And now it's like even bands at, at my level hire producers that are also engineers that are also like Andy Sneap. He will do everything for you. If you get the money, he will do everything. He'll do the entire record, except maybe not master it, right? So times have changed. You've got to keep your brain clear. You have to learn how to play different instruments, write different instruments and parts. Don't rely on anybody else. And, and then you can do it, you know, if you really keep clear on it. But then that's kind of a catch there because when I get into metal, it wasn't all about it wasn't all about business and this and that. It was about having fun, playing music, learning my music. Uh, but it was also, you know, for a long time, it was about partying and having fun and just, you know, and it's tough, man. I, if you don't have the catalog and you're starting out now, you really have to be more on top of it than any of us were in the '80s. And, and record companies, of course, are now using the the, the lack of CD sales as a uh, an excuse to. I mean, they've been doing this for a few decades lack of CD sales, the decline of the CD business, physical CD, physical release stuff, as a reason to take every right that you can possibly have. You know, there's some deals where, for new bands, where they take the publishing, they even take some merchandise design so that they can sell the band's t-shirts on their websites, um, and even to a profit, some labels would take that. Ownership of masters, meaning they would own your music, not just you, you'd license it to them, they would actually, they actually own the masters. So that's kind of like, you can do it, you can definitely make a living at it if you're good, if you're talented, but if the hard work and the being clean has to happen, otherwise you just can't get to the end of the, the goal. And that goal for some is to make a career out of it. And make a career out of it means you gotta be around for a few decades. And that means you, you gotta really learn and get your shit together. You've taken so many musical journeys over the years, over your, your whole career. New album, I mean, thoughts. I mean, there must be something percolating in your head in a direction, an idea. Uh, or do you have any plans? Is it going to be this year, next year? What are your plans for new music, new album, a timeline of some sort? Just finished my first song and vocals this afternoon. Should come out in October. If everything works fine, we should be going out. We should be going out on a bloody huge tour of Europe with a couple of killer killer well-known bands and it looks like the most exciting couple of years I got um, soon new records started out I think in uh, well a little earlier with writing riffs and stuff but the, the serious thing recording it and writing it and recording it was right after the 70,000 tons of metal that we did in February and it was three days off and right into the whole full-on process um, initially the only plan I had was just, okay, you got to stop 
doing something I like to do, which is I love Hetfield and Mustaine and Ozzy and Lane Staley, and uh, I'm not not the, not at the level of those singers, but those are the singers that I I, I like listening to, and I like singing in the shower. You know what I mean, uh, yeah, or in the car. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had too much of that on the last record that I did. It was too much of a fanboy. Uh, you know, it was like 65% fanboy, 35% Waters. So now I've, I've sort of leveled it off to about 75 me. <laughs> so uh, that was that was my plan to get the vocals a little on track. Plus, I was not going to worry about uh, uh, commercial, uh, sorry, catchy, which can be deemed commercial, catchy choruses. I thought, you know what, screw it. Forget the formulas and all that stuff that I, I've been sort of really leaning towards for the last 10 albums or more. Uh, just... Write something messed up. If it doesn't make sense, just do it. Um, and the, uh, what ended up happening is, um, I thought I thought the music is sounding a little like the first two records, um, and the vocals. I ah, it's really hard to explain. But now that the album's coming together, I think it's. Uh, I, I really can't say too much about it because you know what musicians always say about their new upcoming album, right? Yeah, it's, it's their it's best. Always, yeah. yeah, so you just gotta. Have to judge it, but I think it's something really cool this time. That that uh, I also brought in another producer and writer on this one, writer co-writer of the music. I mean, and I sat there with uh, his name's Rich Hinks from the UK, and he's our uh, actually our bass player for the last year. Um, and there was something about him when I knew after I met him and spent a year on the road with him, I realized this is a guy I want to come in and and kick my butt and he knows the band but he knows music and, and studio uh, as well like me but he knows a different a different way about all that than I do so it was either going to work really well together or I was going to say hey man it's not working out go back to England <laughs> and, so, uh, yeah so yeah. to summarize October is a potential October 2017 is a potential release date or is that the completion date no I think that's I, I'm guessing that's going to be the release is October, late October, and uh, two, that's that's what we've been talking about with the label. I'll have the album probably finished before the Canadian tour. Oh wow, that's that's pretty fascinating. So you're saying the direction, Alice in Hell, and uh, Never Neverland, that music. style. Yeah, I think it's. I think musically that, that was not what I was trying to do because there's no chance in a million that I could ever go back and and do what I did on the Never Neverland album. I've always sort of hung on to the hope that I'm going to get that sort of a little more magic back on certain albums. And when I stop getting that like three or four in a row, screw it, I think it's time to call it. But, I, you know, I got that feeling on this one, but you just can't really predict it till it's done. And people, you got to wait for the label, the press and the fans to react to it. I'm a huge fan. And, and, you know, one thing that always crosses my mind, and I know it crosses a lot of fans' minds as well, you know, and what are the chances? What would it take for you? And I know you're doing a great job on vocals. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. What, well, what would it take for you? Free. Sorry. Yeah, I can. I can give you a better one. I can. I can give you an answer that you probably even know what I'm going to say. Sort of. And if not, I'm going to touch on it. It's. I made a joke on the last record after it was done. That some of the press before the last album, Suicide Society, in your uh, in Europe, were like questioning it because they hadn't had a chance to really hear it and they said well are you going to get another singer on the next one and i looked at them and said uh we're we haven't even put this one out yet <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, yeah um and it was it was not defensive it's it's like you know i've had so many musicians and singers i like to to keep it fresh and change up and and there's very rarely people leave my band because of any negativity usually it's you know, when you're a hired person, you go to a, a band that offers you a bigger paycheck, or if you you know you have kids or a job you can't leave, or there, there's lots of reasons. It's if it's not your baby in your band and you're hired for it, a lot of times you have to leave and get go for something that's better in in your life or in your music career. Um, but so when I was asked in the last record, are you thinking of getting another singer? I, I made a joke and I realized it's probably true. The only other singer I think I'm going to end up in with this band. Uh, for however long it goes, it's going to be if Stu Block defects from uh, John Schaefer's Iced Earth, or uh, Tim, if Rob Hal or if Rob Halford wanted to join. What but about I don't think any, of those, any of those are going to happen? Look, I get it. It's your baby. You want. You have a vision. But I, you know, I guess all us fans say, you know, man, if he had 
a singer just as good as he is a guitar player this could yeah. go on to another level right it's more like I wanted to do this new album and try to put more importance on the vocals but not with layering with four voices or five voices and fixing the shitty notes and all that I meant more like one track get back to what I did on albums like King of the Kill and uh, Refresh the Demon um get back to more of that style and I think that's I just wanted to be able to do that once and then if things weren't working out that way then I thought well maybe I'll consider someone else I mean that's always a potent possibility but I think this is a, I think this is my what is my fifth yeah record singing for the band if I got it right I and think you got it right yeah I think our most popular song in the band worldwide is not Alice in Hell <laughs> it's it's not um, from an album called uh, Never Neverland or Alice in Hell. It's actually two songs. One's called King of the Kill, yeah, and that's the most popular song. And then the other one's uh, off of the album called Set the World on Fire, and that's the title track. Yeah. But King of the Kill is actually, to North Americans, a lot of North Americans might remember Annihilator for the first album or the second album or both, uh, Alice in Hell, Never Neverland. And after a while, they start going, oh, shit, they've had, like, what 13 more records out after that and and it's it's because we haven't toured we haven't released records here we haven't done anything so a lot of people will go oh by far your most popular song is this one or fun palace or something like that and i'll be like Ooh, nope <laughs> my next question was you know uh the u.s they have their big four uh you know the teutonic german four what would yeah. be your canadian four thrash metal bands and I guess it would have to be with influence and popularity it all mixed in what would be your four weeks and weeks ago I actually tried to put together a, a big six kind of vibe for Canada okay and what was it Razor Anvil Exciter Annihilator uh, Pile Driver and um, Voivod yeah and uh, I, I talked to most of them and most of them were in and then Anvil has a South American tour at the time we wanted to do it, and another band, this and that. And we sort of, I sort of gave up on it for now, but I thought that would be kind of fun to do, like Canada's Big Six kind of vibe, um, because as small as our population, uh, we, we sure have an original style for our musicians and bands that have came out of here in every kind of music. Because um, we're sandwiched in between the UK and the, and the States musically, so we get the best of both worlds and the worst. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and then you, you look at this and you go, well, Exciter weren't thrash, they were speed metal. And then you look at Voivod and they're not thrash, they're like progressive, spaced out rock metal. You know, like they're they're totally unique. Um, and Piledriver is kind of a, you know, they're, they're all different. And I leaders, if you have to put labels on it, I'd say we're a heavy metal meets thrash metal band because how can you say that our 12 ballads on all our albums are, are thrash? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And our, um, some of our instrumentals are literally elevator music, and some of them are classical guitar pieces. So it's really tough to use the label stuff. But um, I wouldn't, if I was putting it together, I wouldn't call it the big six of thrash, Canada's thrash. I would just put metal, you know? It's normal for me to do all that stuff because this is the only job I have. But for the other guys, and most of the guys that in, and most of the bands we just mentioned, I'm out of that six we were talking about. I think. Other than Anvil, I think I'm the only one that does this full time. And now switching gears a bit, I mean, talking about the King of Thrash, and I know you get asked this question every single time, with Dave Mustaine. I'm not going to get into the. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. I know that he's asked you many times in the past. You know, to yeah. be. Uh, uh, I don't want. I don't want to touch on that subject if it's. You know, you've talked about it too no, much. No, that's all right. I don't care. Um, uh, Dave Mustaine, he's asked you. You know, at the beginning of your career, sort of to to to, to at least come down, right? and to work with him for some songs, to, to be a touring guitarist. Uh, work, I, I know you've actually, uh, you know, lend, uh, sorry, I asked him perhaps, or maybe you could tell me, uh, called out to Dave, hey Dave, come on over, let's do something together. Any news over the years? The first contact I had with Dave, like I pretty well almost, I don't know what the word is, not fainted, but I pretty well just, went whoa are you kidding me Dave Mustaine wants to talk was 89 we we're on tour with Testament in the States Chuck Billy comes into my room hotel room and says uh, Jeff Mustaine's on the phone and I'm looking at him like yeah right 
And he goes, no, Mustaine's on the phone. And of course, when Chuck Billy, even then, in those younger years, was standing over you while you're sitting on the edge of your hotel bed, telling you, no, get the phone, it's Dave Mustaine, you believe him. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, you know, Dave was clearly, by his own words, uh, messed up back then. I was on booze at the time, uh, just the beginnings of my crazy drinking times, but he essentially said, listen, I've got a couple of guys I want to talk to, but I want to talk to you first, and uh, I like your Alice in Hell album, blah, 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 and uh, I was blown away, and I had to actually turn it down on the next phone call a day or two later because I just signed a deal with Roadrunner Records for a couple albums, and we just had the album exploded. My manager said, no, you can't do it, buddy. <laughs> There's no way. Um, and so I had to tell him no, and he hung up the phone immediately, and that was the last I talked to him. Um, later on, yeah, I mean, I told him it was an honor, but I guess it was, you know, and he, he also made the right choice because he, he was eyeing a few other people, and the best guy got the gig for that one, of course, with Marty Friedman. And, and with me in there, you might not have got rust in peace the way that everybody loved it. Well, wait, 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 wait a second there, Jeff. Maybe you would have got something even better than rust in peace. You never know that, right? Ah, who knows? Who knows? But, I mean, I kind of look at it, too. Like, I, it would have been an honor, but... Uh, because him and I were both admittedly messed up back then, that might have been a, quite a clash. Uh, but I don't think musically, I think, because obviously he'd be the boss. I think for me, it would have been simply I would have drank myself to death too much, right? I would have tried to stay away from drugs and everything. And if I was successful, I would have just made up for that with excessive drinking, which I actually did later on. Um, but then after a while, years later, I think 2000 and I don't know, four or five, somewhere in that, three, four, five, somewhere in there when he was doing a record with Chris Poland, he called up and uh, said, yeah, having a fight and you want to come and do some solos? Can you come down tomorrow? I said, well, yeah, probably. And then he called back and said, no, I, I, I worked it out with Chris. And then Chris did the solos on that record he was talking about. And then there was, you know, I think it was shortly after that, um, he got the Drover brothers in and he had talked to me for weeks before he made the announcement about uh, Sean and Glenn Dover, um, about the guitar player, Glenn. Um, and he was, we were talking about, you know, writing together and doing, you know, just how, how it would work and what he expected and what I told him what I, why I could understand what he'd want because I've been hiring my guys. I know exactly what he'd want from somebody. Um, but he, I think he, I think his manager probably convinced him that it would be a lot cheaper deal to just grab the the other guy, and uh, otherwise Jeff would have to shut down his his annihilator stuff. So it was all kind of like back and forth. He was going to play on this metal this album called Metal we did in 2007. Uh, you know, I see him over the years. We have dinner. You know, do something. Uh, he he took me out for sushi or just before Christmas in New York. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> From from uh, I think it was a Revolver Epiphone Golden Gods Awards we were down there and um, played with his drummer Dirk uh, did some stuff there with Bumblefoot and, and Ace Freely was on there anyway so it's been kind of like you know I even got a call once can I fill in for his guitar tech for five Western Canadian shows and I was like you know what I would love to do that it'd be a lot of fun but I just couldn't get past standing on the side of the stage cleaning his guitar looking at uh Looking, looking at the guys in Slayer who were playing after them. <laughs> so, you know what? I, I mean, is there any part of you that said, you know what, man, just one record with Dave, just one no, record was, with Dave? I was, I was thinking of uh, like David. Uh, Dave Elfson is probably the nicest guy I've ever met in the music business out of, of all the musicians I've met, and him and I talk all the time, and um, you know. It, I, I was telling Dave to mention to Dave that, you know, I would like to write one song. I'll pay for the flight. I'll pay for the hotel room. Let's write a freaking tune because I have a feeling that him and I writing a couple of songs together would be really, really cool. I think that that would be something fantastic. I, I think oh, it would be. Uh, but, but I got to back that up one more. I think right. what would be even cooler, even just... 2% cooler, it would be me and Gary Holt. I think that would be a pairing. I think Kerry King, uh, personally, I was so excited when I heard that, that Holt had joined, because I know Gary really 
really fit into that gig and it was it came at the right time in his life yeah um, and I'd been talking to him just before the Slayer gig and I I foresaw King and Holt sitting down and writing literally rain in fabulous disaster blood <laughs> south yeah. of heaven part two cool <laughs> you know? cool cool uh, it, I, it's just I don't I'm not sure that Holt's writing able to write with uh, Slayer but I sure hope that happens for the metal world so the tour begins Victoria going through Canada from west to east all the way to Cornwall Montreal of course June 29th thanks for watching the show Jeff Waters my guest Annihilator catch him on the Canadian tour pick up uh, Triple Threat live DVD unplugged and uh, a live DVD unplugged and what else is on it a live show right and yeah. also really? Suicide Society great album I loved it Thanks.